all of these programs are not just for the sake of filling up halls and having series of lectures, but rather, my dear brothers and sisters, this is an effort to bring the deen back into our lives in the way that it needs to be. We heard a very inspiring talk about those light bearers who are still 1400 years later serving as models and examples for us. That is the direction forward. And when we come here, basically we are consolidating the willpower and the enthusiasm of hundreds and hundreds of people to build an environment that propels all of us forward. You see, we feed off of each other. Everyone who comes brings with them their own presence. And when that presence is motivated by coming towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then just by coming into this hall, you have become a source of other people to move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's bringing all of the intentions and the motivations and the desire to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from an entire audience. And when we come into that environment, immerse ourselves, it, make it, it makes it easy for us to start our journey or move forward on our journey or move quicker on our journey. Ultimately, what we aim for is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we aim for forgiveness in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the most cherished thing. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was on his deathbed, people came and said various things to pacify him, to make him happy. That you hold this status, you hold this rank. The Prophet ﷺ said this about you, he said this about you. Remember those things, remember those things. Which is what should be done for a person who is in their last moments. He said, look, I know what you're saying, but right now my position is such that I would like to leave this world in such a state with my account just balanced. La alayya wa la if I can get out of here and none of that comes into my account, none of these good deeds and whatever you're counting comes into my account, but also nothing is held against me, I am happy. These people understood how valuable and how delicate it was to appear in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a clear account. That's why when he sent his son Abdullah ibn Umar to Aisha radiallahu anha to request permission that can I be buried next to my two companions. He said, um, Abdullah, go and ask her, but do not say Amir al-Mu'mineen is asking. Say Umar ibn al-Khattab is asking. فَإِنِّي لَسْتُ الْيَوْمَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَمِيرًا I'm no one's Amir today. I'm just a person who is in the last phase of this life preparing to move ahead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm no one's Amir. And he had had himself laid down on the ground, on the dirt. And people said, why are you doing this? He said, how can I sit and recline on a comfortable bed when I don't know in what condition I'm about to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I don't know. That he might be displeased with me and I'm here reclining comfortably on pillows. When Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah came back with news from Aisha radiallahu anha, he said, sit me up. I need to hear this news sitting up, not lying down. And he was in immense pain because he had been, essentially, as we say, he'd been gutted. His whole stomach had been torn by the wound that was inflicted on him. But he forcefully sits up and he hears the news sitting up. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma says that, Father, she has granted permission. So he said, Alhamdulillah. But he said, Son, when I die, I want you to take my janazah and stop there in front of her house one more time and get her permission one more time. And at that moment, if she says yes, 
he is allowed, then bury me there, otherwise take me to the graveyard of the Muslims. Nothing mattered more to these people than gaining the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their actions were the actions of someone who recognizes their sin, sees their own weakness and is struggling, trying most earnestly to win the forgiveness of Allah. That's what we all are. But sometimes we start acting as if we are entitled to that forgiveness even though no one is entitled to that forgiveness. And so if it is forgiveness that we seek from Allah Azza wa Jal, then one of the easiest ways, one of the quickest ways to get the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal is to learn to forgive others in this life. It's one of the shortest paths to win the forgiveness of Allah because the rule is al jaza'u min jins al-amal. Retribution is in kind of the action. The type of actions we do are the type of consequences, good and bad, that we get. So we see the life of the Prophet wasallam as a very complex story of severe emotional crises because he was abused, insulted, oppressed, physically hurt, so socially boycotted, emotionally disturbed, threatened, harassed. Uditu fillahi wa lam yu'da ahad. I have been hurt in the sake of Allah, for the sake of Allah, in ways that no one has been. And I have been threatened in the way of Allah like no one has been threatened. How did he cope with that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him an immense heart. And he, not once or twice, every day he was forgiving people. Every day. Because every day someone was coming and doing something unacceptable to him. In fact, people who had read the previous scriptures knew that this is going to be one of the hallmarks of the last prophet. A man by the name of Zayd ibn Sa'ana had read in his scriptures in the Torah that the last prophet will be someone whose tolerance outweighs their reaction. The reaction to something, the instant, uneducated reaction. His tolerance is always above that. And if anyone acts ignorantly to him, the more ignorantly they act, the more tolerant and clement he becomes. So he said, I had seen every other sign of prophethood in this man except for this, and I needed to see it. One day, a Bedouin comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and says, O Prophet of Allah, my tribe has recently accepted Islam and they are currently inflicted with severe drought, famine, starvation. They're going through a very difficult time and I'm afraid that if we don't help them, they might leave Islam from the same door that they entered into. So the Prophet ﷺ turns to Ali anhu and asks him that do we have anything in Baytul Mal? So Ali radiallahu says that we've just emptied the treasury, we've just used it on other needy people, we don't have anything. So this man Zayd sees an opportunity. He says, it looks like you guys could use some financial assistance, something of a plug to get through this immediate situation. So I have an offer for you. I'll buy dates from you. I know you guys have your orchards and they're producing dates reg regularly. I'm a person who trades in dates. So let me buy dates from you and I'll pay you the money up front. You can use that money for whatever need you have. 
The Prophet ﷺ agreed. And the time was set for one month or so, that in one month, the dates will be delivered. Now this man waits until there are about two or three days left in the payment date. And as the Prophet ﷺ is sitting with some of his companions, he goes up to him and grabs him by the front of the shirt, just as he is rising. He grabs him and lifts him up and starts insulting him, insulting his family, insulting Banu Abdul Muttalib. All you people are lazy in your payments. You're slow in your payments. You're like this. You don't honor your word. You don't do this. And Umar ibn al-Khattab happens to be right there. And he grabs the man. He says, O oh, enemy of Allah, you dare to say these things in our presence to the Prophet ﷺ? His eyes were like spinning in their sockets. So this man Zaid got obviously very scared. Umar looks over to the Prophet ﷺ and he sees that the Prophet ﷺ is calm and he's got a smile on his face. And he says, Umar, he and I are both in need of something else. I am in need right now of being told that, O oh Prophet of Allah, you should pay your dues on time. And he is, be, he is in need of being told that, look gentlemen, there's a nicer way to ask for your dues. You don't have to do it like this so crudely. So then the Prophet ﷺ says to Umar, that now you go, you will go and pay, make the payment to him, and on top of what we owe him, you will give him 20 more sa'as of dates. One sa'a is, let's just say, three and a half kilos. You will give him 20 more sa'as. Why? To compensate him for having threatened him, for having frightened him. So Umar goes, now he who was the one who was the most upset, the, the tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ, you're going to be the one who goes, the last one who wants to even look at this guy. You will go and pay him. Umar weighs out the dates or measures out the dates, gives it to him and then he starts measuring out all this extra quantity. The man says, what's this extra for? He says, the Prophet ﷺ commanded me to compensate you for having threatened you. Then the man says, Umar, do you know who I am? He says, no, I don't know who you are. He said, I'm Zayd ibn Sa'ana. Umar says, what? The Jewish rabbi? He said, yeah. He said, an educated man like you acting like this? He said, look, I had seen all of the signs of Nubuwa that were mentioned in the previous scriptures about the last prophet. I had seen all of them in this Nabi except for these two. That his tolerance will always be far ahead of any ignorant response from him. And the more ignorantly people behave with him, the more clemently he will behave with them. And then he made Umar radiallahu anhu the first witness of his shahada and he took shahada then and there. The Prophet ﷺ travels towards Najd. Famous incident. He lies down beneath a tree and he hangs his sword on that tree. He opens his eyes to see this Bedouin standing over him with his own sword and says, minni. Who's going to save you from me? He's standing over the Prophet ﷺ with the sword brandished. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah, Allah, Allah. The man got so scared, he dropped the sword. The Prophet ﷺ picks up the sword. He says, Mayyam na'uka minni. Who saves you from me? The man says, Kun khayra akhid. Please be nice. So in the meantime, Sahaba radiallahu anhum gathered. The Prophet ﷺ said, look, this guy, he pulled out my sword and he threatened me with it and this is what happened. So, now everyone wants to do something to this man. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, let him go. He let him go. He asked him as he was leaving that, do you want to accept Islam? He said, no. But I will never fight against you, nor will I ever help anyone who fights against you. And that was the end of it. One of the most difficult ordeals that the Prophet ﷺ and his family went through 
was the incident of ifk. The slander against Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha. People started rumors and created this conversation, this gossip. And only Allah knows what Aisha radiallahu anha went through. She says, I started crying and I did not stop crying. For almost one month, she is, she's just crying without, without stopping. And she says, I, In that whole month, I could not sleep. How miserable they made the beloved wife of the Prophet ﷺ. How miserable must have the Prophet ﷺ been? How miserable must have parents been? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually revealed the verses in Surah An-Nur to exonerate Aisha radiallahu anha and to explain how innocent she was and the fault of those who had come up with this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it ifk. It's a slander. It is a group from amongst you who created this thing. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanded, very, very strongly reprimanded anyone who opened their mouth at that time. One of the people who had become embroiled in this was the cousin of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. His Khala's son, Mistah ibn Uthatha. And just like sometimes, you know, there's a conversation, it just sucks you in. People are saying, they're talking about, they're talking about something in a certain way, then you just feel compelled to become part of that conversation. Well, he became part of that conversation. Even though when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, he had nothing. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is the one who was sustaining him. Basically, he had no means of income except for the charity of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was paying for all his expenses. When his name came up as one of the people who were having this conversation, and he was punished for it as well. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did not seek to take revenge that I'm going to kill him, I'm going to cut his tongue off, I'm going to do this and this and this. All he said was, Wallahi la anfa'uhu binafi'atin abada. I'm not going to help him anymore. Which for a father, the father of the girl who has been slandered for him to say something like this, is a very, very mild and tempered response. You would say this goes for, this is for granted that of course that's not going to happen. What else is he going to do? But that was all he said. I'm not going to spend on him anymore. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا الْقُرْبَى وَالْمُسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Those amongst you who have been given wealth and means should not take this oath, such an oath, that they will not give. Give to who? أُولِي الْقُرْبَى Their close relatives, المساكين, those who are poor, those who have migrated in the path of Allah. This ayah was revealed for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to leave this world with a clean heart. And not have anything diminished from the reward that he was accumulating from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the reasons. And this is where there is a very important lesson for all of us. Because when someone wrongs us, all our mind is able to focus, focus on is what they've, what they've done wrong. And this is natural. The only thing that's ringing through our ears at that moment is that, that insult that came out of their mouth. The thing that keeps spinning in our head is the memory of that moment when they misbehaved, when they did that ridiculous thing, when they did that hurtful thing. That's all that's going through our mind. 
So now that moment, to us, that moment is what defines that person. They are reduced to what they did to us in that moment because that's all that matters. And the Qur'an here is giving Abu Bakr anhu reasons that you need to come out of that mindset, mindset of what he did and what he said because this person is more than what he did just in that minute. There is more to him than that. And there are other things. If that thing that he did tore you away from him, there are other things that still connect you to him. The first is Udil Qurba. He is your first cousin. He's a son of your khala. And think of what the Quran says about Silatul Rahim. Joining family ties. So, oh Abu Bakr, here's one reason for you to let this go. That he is your immediate relative. Number two, wal masakin. He's also poor. He's destitute. He has nothing of his own. What does Allah say? What does Rasulullah say about such people? Let's say you don't know them, but you know that their situation is weak financially. What is your responsibility as a Muslim, O Abu Bakr? Your responsibility is to help him. And this person has migrated for the sake of Allah. وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Abu Bakr a whole bunch of reasons to come out of that mindset and say, yes, what he's done is unacceptable, but there are other things that still link me to him and him to me. I need to get past this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the instruction. They need to pardon and they need to put it past them. Afu means to pardon. And Saf, it means to turn the other cheek. I'rad. Just leave it. Act like it didn't happen. This takes, a, this takes an immense heart. Yeah Allah, this is a huge challenge. How am I going to do it? Allah says, let me tell you how you're going to do it. It works like this. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ One day, when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every major and minor mistake of yours is going to be exposed. And your book of deeds is going to be opened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take anything from that book. It could be something minor, it could be something major. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take anything from that book and use it to give you the sentence of Jahannam. You don't know what act in there is going to get you caught. At that time, everyone's heart is going to be hoping, Oh Allah, definitely there are mistakes in there, but please let them go. Please pardon them. Please don't hold them against me. Please don't punish me, not today. Oh Allah, let them go. You are the most forgiving, you're the most merciful. That's where everyone's heart is going to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if you want me to treat you with forgiveness in that moment, you need to start treating people with forgiveness here in this world. Don't you want that Allah forgives you on that day? Don't you want His pardon? Well then, learn to pardon others. Right away, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, Bala, wa ana uhibbu an yaghfir Allahu li. Of course, I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pardon me when I need it the most. Then he made another oath. Wallahi la anzi'u min, anzi'uhu minhu abada. I will never stop spending on this man as long as I live. We only get forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the extent that we are ready to forgive other people. It doesn't mean that what they did was right. Absolutely not. Nor does it make us the weaker person. That we were not able to retaliate. In fact, the greatest act is to forgive when you are in a position to take revenge. 
We had a chance to say something back. We found a flaw of theirs that we could have exploited. At that moment, we restrained ourselves. And this leads us directly to the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have so many sins that we perform intentionally, unintentionally. We don't even know sometimes that we're sinning. So we cannot rely solely on our own, on the, on the merit of our own good deeds and on, on the abstinence of our bad deeds. But one thing we can rely on, one thing we can always bank on is the mercy of Allah. The forgiveness of Allah and the mercy of Allah is something we can rely on. Allah is telling us how to access it. So let us learn to clean these hearts. Rid them of any ill feelings. As they say, let bygones be bygones. Let's not carry it around with us in our system because it burdens us. It weighs us down. It disables us from moving forward in our lives and moving forward closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it breaks apart families and friendships and communities and societies and nations. It has to stop somewhere. If we can start doing this for each other, then the bonds will become stronger and we will truly be leaving behind an ummah to the people after us. Otherwise, we will be leaving behind fragmented families, fragmented communities, fragmented societies. So let's make the intention, first of all, that we want to, get, we want to gain the ultimate forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal. Number one. Number two, we are going to take it upon ourselves to start forgiving. If you can't forgive the big stuff right away, start forgiving the small stuff and the big stuff will follow. You got to start somewhere. But don't hold everything in your heart because it will destroy us. It will ruin us. And the worst part of it is it lowers us in the sight of Allah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us His forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allow us entry into Jannah without hisab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove from us the burdens of our mistakes, whether they were in the form of commissions or omissions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable those who we have wronged to forgive us and those who have wronged us for us to forgive them so that ultimately we stand forgiven in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته